Hi, my name is Josh and we are rather excitingly here at the Natural History Museum's Wales store with one of our scientists, Jack, who has been talking a little bit about what animals make the loudest sounds. So if you haven't seen that video, do check it in the link below. Um, but first of all, Jack, hello, welcome. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> um, and can you just tell us exactly what it is we've got behind us here? Yeah, absolutely. So this is the skull of the animal that produces the loudest noise out of all of them, a sperm whale. As you can see here, this is uh, not quite the maximum size that they reach, but it is still incredibly iconic. They have a very, very strange shape to them. They are some of the largest animals on the planet as well. They are the largest of the odontocetes, the whales with teeth, um, and they're quite fascinating. As I said, we're here in the whale store and mm. some of the other skulls are huge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really massive. Um, but we were just going to talk a bit about why they are, why they're so big, why they're so um, strangely shaped, because they are really peculiar, even sort of within sort of the natural world, I guess. So one of the most uh, noticeable things, if you were to look at the inner details of the sperm whale skull here, is that they have an asymmetrical skull. Um, this is a thing that is present for uh, all odontocetes. Um, and the reason for it is it actually helps them in terms of their echolocation. Uh, odontocetes often use that echolocation to hunt, just like the sperm whale here, that using that really loud noise. And it's really helpful because it helps them to locate where their prey is. Think about it this way, if it was all the same shape at the back, uh, they'd sound would hit at the same time. Whereas with a little bit of deviation in the asymmetry, we can actually, they can actually locate where their prey is because it hits at different times at the back of the skull. Oh, that's cool. So it helps them sort of judge the distance, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to, to kind of locate the prey as well. And how unusual is that asymmetry in sort of natural world? Yeah, animals? quite, quite unusual for vertebrates. Um, as I said, it is something that is present in uh, the whales with teeth in their odontocetes and also slightly in the baleen whales as well. Mm. But otherwise, it's not something that you generally come across. You know, the rule is kind of bilateral symmetry. Everything is symmetrical down the middle, uh, at least in vertebrates. And if you look um, right in the middle of the skull, you can really see it's really obvious. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's incredible, really. Um, as well as that basin uh, size that they have, too. It's a really amazing skull. We were having a little chat beforehand. That basin is almost like a satellite dish, right? For mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Um, and also the basin, the kind of basin they have there is also to help support uh, some of the organs that really help in their echolocation mm -hmm. as well. Which we can go on to. So, mm -hmm. so we've talked about obviously the asymmetry yep. and the way in which they produce those clicks, but I mean, what, what else is going on in the whale's head? Yeah, so, well, uh, for starters, they have kind of on the bottom here, they would have quite a large melon. Melons uh, are seen in a lot of our other odontocetes, uh, but the, that is helping with echolocation in terms of amplifying the noise and also uh, when the noise comes back through. Uh, but on top of that, unique to the sperm whale and what gives them that huge bulky head mm. is the spermacetate organ. Um, and this is an organ that's almost like a fleshy barrel filled with waxy, oily substance called a spermacetate. And this helps um, in terms of amplifying their noise. Mm. And presumably, is that where we get the name sperm whale from? Yeah, it literally means spermacetate, cetate, cetaceans, whales. It's whale sperm because that's what whalers thought it was when they were uh, cutting these things open at first. It's quite a waxy wow. white substance. Wow, that's wild. Mm. Um, and so they are using this um, spermacete to effectively amplify the sound, is that right? The way that it kind of works that they produce their sound is through, uh, we mentioned in the uh, Surprising Science, the phonic lips. Mm -hmm. uh, the phonic lips are located internally just below the blowhole, kind of at the top of that bulky head. Uh, the left nasal passage goes up to the blowhole, the right nasal passage goes to the phonic lips, and by passing air through that nasal passage up there, um, that is how they produce these clicks and uh, what are known as codas, which are unique to sometimes to very specific pods of sperm whales. Mm. So like a coda is almost like a, um, a song almost, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something that is like quite, can be quite unique to each sperm whale pod because they are quite social animals. If you think about you know, the, the cultural trends we might see in uh, killer whales, uh, I'm sure you might have heard about the salmon hats and uh, <laughs> yes. things like that. Yeah, it's really strange. These are really social animals, quite intelligent animals too. I should mention that along with the large melon and spermacetes, they do also have the largest brain of any animal. So uh, wow. yes, socialization is a very important part of the sperm whale life uh, and these clicks and codas really help them with it. So they use them to help them sort of communicate and talk to each other. And when it comes, obviously, socialization is really important in these whales. I mean, as is the teeth of these whales are yeah, also yeah. huge. Yeah. Um, and what does that tell us about what they eat and like how they feed and that kind of thing? Yeah, so the interesting thing about sperm whales is they do have really cool, quite big teeth. But the first thing you'll notice if you were to look around is that they don't have any on the upper jaw, mm -hmm. um, quite oddly. So they basically have these kind of slots where the lower teeth 
uh, go into. Uh, the way that sperm whales feed is through suction feeding. Um, essentially, they can kind of move their tongue in a way to create this vacuum that will be able to suck in nearby food. This is incredibly effective at feeding. We don't actually think that the teeth are entirely necessary in this kind of feeding function because we have found adults that have no teeth and also uh, here in the collections, there's some malformed jaws as well of quite old uh, mm. specimens. So they could have reached maturity w uh, just by using suction feeding and not necessarily needing the teeth, though they are capable of grasping. The one that we have in the collections here is quite extraordinary. It's almost like a spiral shape yeah. door, isn't it? And it's quite hard to imagine that something like that could survive in yeah. the wild mm. to that age. It's just the effectiveness of that suction feeding that they do and what they feed on then yeah. um, is mainly uh, things like mid-sized squid, but we also know that they will sometimes feed on giant squid. Um, not only do we find the beaks inside of their digestive tracts, mm -hmm. uh, but also skin marks from the suckers of giant squids as well. So yeah, they're fighting underneath the deep sea. <laughs> <laughs> One of those cartoons are true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so when they are going down to hunt, I mean, do we know where they hunt and how they hunt these squids? Yeah, so these guys can uh, dive down quite deep. They generally uh, hunt around, I believe, 300 to 800 meters, but they can get down to regularly uh, feeding at like below one to two kilometers as well. So some of the deepest diving um, mammals in the world that we have here. Uh, and yet, they, they, this is why the echolocation is so important. It's super dark down there. You're not going to be able to tell exactly what's going on. Um, so you need to be able to locate your prey without any visual uh, ability. So yeah, echolocation is absolutely fantastic at spotting these soft-bodied organisms. Um, and also sometimes uh, mid-sized kind of demersal fish as well, fish that are just swimming around near the, mm. in the deep. Mm. I always think it's wild that they go so deep and they can still find prey yeah. even in the vastness <laughs> of the ocean. Oh no, they are absolutely <laughs> incredible. Like they're really effective hunters as well, yeah. you know, it's just something about that suction feeding that is just super effective. And when it comes to that social structure, is there any evidence of sort of um, uh, that bonding and like feeding with, within the group? Yes, yeah, so uh, they generally stay in quite variable uh, pods of, I believe it's usually around six to eight individuals. It's usually comprised of females and their calves, and then the bulls stay separate and will only join the pods when breeding or socializing as well. Um, and in terms of evidence of like their social structure, uh, one of the things that they'll do if there's ever an injured uh, member of the pod is that they can actually, they will gather around in this almost like flower formation around them oh. to protect the injured individual. Um, there's accounts of this uh, in some great cultural works like uh, Moby Dick. Mm. Um, and. The thing was, unfortunately, this behavior was kind of used by whalers to attract uh, more uh, sperm whales to the pod. So they might injure one on purpose just so more could get nearby. Oh, wow. So mm. they're so sort of, they're gregarious. So that sort of sociality was almost used against them. Yeah, unfortunately, sense. yeah. Yeah. I mean, that sort of gets us on quite nicely to um, sort of their conservation status, because obviously historically mm -hmm. they have been quite um, badly targeted by hunters mm -hmm. and their numbers did decline. I was wondering if you could talk us through a bit about that. Yeah, so right now they are considered uh, vulnerable, uh, thankfully, because there have been good conservation efforts. Whaling of these guys continued up until uh, at least the late 1980s. Um, it wasn't until the International Whaling Commission banned them because they were such a vulnerable species. Mm -hmm. Pre-whaling, and it should be added, the reason why they uh, were hunted so much was for the spermacetae. Uh, this was used as oils for things like candles, but also like a lubricant as well. Mm. Um, so it was actually really important in uh, manufacturing and also uh, even used in like car engines, um, I believe. So uh, this was up until, yeah, 1980s. There is sometimes, uh, there is protected whaling of these done by indigenous communities, mm -hmm. um, but this is all done in a sustainable way. Um, whereas the wide scale whaling has been completely stopped. And do we know anything about how they're doing now, like their numbers, have they started to recover? Yes, yeah, so I, uh, the thing is because they live so long, uh, they actually live about 70 years. Hmm. They have a gestation period of 16 months. Uh, some females will only have a baby once every four to 20 years. So it's quite a big event when a sperm whale uh, baby is born. So in terms of that kind of recovery, yes, it will take a while, but mm. as long as they are protected, mm. um, it should be stable. The largest threats they face at the moment are the same thing as a lot of other uh, cetacean species that are also very heavily protected. It's unfortunately down to things like noise pollution in the water and also uh, general changes related to climate change or warming mm -hmm. of the oceans. Yeah, I mean, I guess if they were only stopped hunting in the 1980s, mm. that's the, like within a, within a sperm whale's lifetime, that's not actually that long, right? Exactly, yeah, and there was a big impact, especially on the mature males. It was hunting down the spermacetae in particular. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk us through these amazing animals and some of their biology. Um, it's truly fascinating and they are really quite extraordinary animals. Mm.
Wow, I just simply cannot get over how big and amazing these sperm whale skulls are. Let us know in the comments below what your favorite sperm whale fact was. And if you enjoyed what you saw, then don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.